from Microbe TV. This is Q and A with A and V. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me tonight from New York, Amy Rosenfeld. Hello, Amy. Hi, hey, Vincent. How are you today? I just realized that from Microbe TV, this is Q and A with A and V. It kind of rhymes, doesn't it? It does. Wait a minute. There's my my EV68 moved. It's now sitting on the sofa. It needs its own hair light. I I put it there today when I recorded Immune because I wanted something in the background. <laughs> I understand, but now it's dark. It needs its own hair light, don't you think? It doesn't. It does need a hair light. I do. I do think <laughs> you have a good color tonight. It's really perfect. It kind of matches my shirt, actually. It's good. Well, it's courtesy of. Richard, right? Richard and his lights. Uh, Richard, yes, Richard. I don't know if Richard's listening now or maybe. Oh, he, I'm um, sure he'll listen. We'll listen I'm later. Sure but yes, listen. thank you, Richard, for yeah, great. sending nice lights to Amy, which uh, will follow her wherever she goes. Yes, but now my EV68 is feeling neglected. It needs a hair light. Okay, we'll get you a hair light for the. <laughs> no, time. not me. My, my uh, no for the EV sixty eight. No problem. No not problem. Me. I don't need a hair light. My EV sixty eight needs a hair light. Yeah. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Look at this: one hundred seventy five people uh, on a Wednesday evening. Well, because it, we changed times. We're back to eight p.m. because my virology course has ended, so now I can be assured to get home at this hour. This evening, I actually got home before because I had to record the first episode of Daniel's new infectious disease puscast with the blessings of Mark Chrislip, who ended his puscast, where Daniel and Sarah Dong are continuing it. So look for the first episode next week. Uh, this will be all things other than COVID. <laughs> all things other than COVID. Right, for the moment. <laughs> well, um, that's good. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that, and it was a good episode tonight. So uh, another uh, expansion of the Microbe TV science education endeavor. What do you think of that, Amy? I think it's good. It's always good to, it's always good to expand. Should we dive into some questions, Dr. Rosenfeld? Okay. Oh, first we have to thank the moderators who are here tonight. They're all here. Les, wow. Tom, Vanity Nutrition, Steph, and Frank. Thank you all Great. for joining us. Amy and, I, Amy and I were discussing the frequency of this, uh, this Q&A. Um, we're not sure if we should remain weekly or if that's too much. If you want to go every other week, let us know your thoughts. You, what do you think, Amy? You, you you okay with weekly? Yeah, it's good. Um, but you know, it depends on whether you're able to continue, right? It's good. Well, we'll see how it works out. I have stuff to do. I always have stuff to do. Wash Eliza's, develop plaque assays, put overlay on. Always have stuff to do. So someone said, uh, don't say pus, say purulence. Yeah, purulence is the correct word, but Mark Chrislips was called, called uh, the Puzzcast, and so we're just taking up his name because it has a name and a lot of people recognize it. And I spoke with Mark, and I said, can we uh, continue? To, can we produce it for you? So Because he got tired of doing it. And he said, no, I don't want to do it anymore, but you can have it. Go run with it, he said. So there yeah. we are. And if you change the name, the other listeners won't know. It's not a good plan. Got to be consistent. All right, let's dive into some questions. Simon says, would love to know your thoughts on the new occurrences of hepatitis, which are being blamed either on SARS-CoV-2 or adenovirus. So we just did a TWIV yesterday on that, which hasn't dropped right. yet and will not drop at midnight because I have not had a chance to edit it. I'm very sorry. Hopefully tomorrow I can edit it. But tomorrow is a three-podcast Thursday, plus office hours. So anyway, there have been a, 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 over 150 cases of severe hepatitis in young kids, 
some of them requiring liver transplants in over 10 countries, many of them in the UK. Some of them, that with, in some they've isolated adenovirus 40, which is an unusual enteric adeno, but it's never been associated with hepatitis before. Uh, and of course, in some of the kids they've isolated SARS-CoV-2, and in some they've isolated both SARS-CoV-2 and adenovirus. So the, the current line is that we have no idea what's causing this, and it could simply be that we are looking harder, so we're revealing things that we didn't see before that were there. Any thoughts, Amy? Um, well, I wonder if they're all healthy children. Good question. Good question. Don't have the data. So I wonder if this is like you get some, you get like you get a SARS-CoV-2 infection, you get immune compromised, and then this is like an opportunistic infection, like what you see with flu and bacteria or what we saw initially with like HIV and other ba other bacteria and viruses that commonly live within us. Because, right, you, that's what you saw with, you got immune compromised with HIV and then you had outbreaks of Kaposiarcoma, right? Yeah. KSHAB. So I wonder if all of these children are healthy. I think it's a good question. And in, in the research I did, I didn't see that. I have no idea. I have. I mean, I've kind of followed it, but I haven't really followed it that tightly. I have a, I have a more recent update from the UK, uh, which I haven't had a chance to look at. Kathy Spindler just sent it to me. I have to take a look at that. Okay, uh, Nick says, interesting stat, two-thirds of all COVID cases in the EU have been recorded in the last five months. It's interesting. I think maybe you should call them SARS-CoV-2, right, Amy? They're probably not all COVID. Yeah, I don't think you should call them COVID cases. So, so that brings up a point I wanted to address. Uh, Which, as, wait, is this going to go back to last week in Peter Hotez, where he was very displeased with a certain individual in the IBC? Or wait, Peter was Hotez. that, that Peter was Steve, Morris? Steve Morris. Whatever his name is. Yeah. You know so, who I'm talking about. Basically, so you know the vice president of the U.S. tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, but everyone is saying she has COVID. She doesn't have COVID. As far as I know, she doesn't have symptoms. Do you know that she has symptoms, Amy? I have no idea. Anyway, if you test positive, you have SARS-CoV-2. If you have symptoms, then you have COVID, okay? So it, it is a distinction, and it's important. And so a lot of this cases in the EU are probably just testing positive, maybe without symptoms. So that's that's all I'm saying. I, I think the stat is interesting that there have been a lot more. But, uh, you know, you have to um, distinguish. Oh, we well, have I don't a good... know. Wait, I don't yeah, know yeah. that I would like. I don't know that I could say that there's a lot more, considering the fact that testing has waxed and waned in various places. Yes. So I um um, it it bothers me when we try to make these comparisons because, as I said, testing efficiency has waxed and waned, and so you would have to go and find something that some past time where the testing was of equal equal occurrence, right? Yeah, agreed. So it's, I don't know that we can say anything. Yeah, I agree with that. So someone said, principal manager says, Harris is asymptomatic. Okay, so she's tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. She doesn't have COVID. And if you want to argue with me, you will lose because <laughs> there's a difference between. And if you argue with Amy, you will lose also even worse than if you argued with me on this, because COVID is the disease and SARS-CoV-2 is the virus for which you are tested. And that we have a true. new word. We have a new word, Amy, veeps, virus veeps. peeps. What is virus peeps? Do you know the saying peeps, hey peeps? You know, when you say, hey people, it's a short thing. It's a contemporary cultural slang thing, peeps. Seriously, you're going to teach me about being hip? No, never, <laughs> never. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't do that. <laughs> the girl who walks around in purple shoes with a with with the Oscar the Green hat. Can you show people it. your purple shoes? Do you have them on? I Amy have bought them recycled on. material purple shoes. What are they made of? Recycled what? 
They're recycled bottles, plastic bottles. I think that's a great color. Yeah. These are my Very nice. These are one of my purple shoes, but yeah. Um anyway, what was I saying? So you've heard the the expression I've peeps, heard, yeah, right? Peeps. So now now Veeps is a, is virus peeps. I think that's great. Thank you, Jeff. Cool. Who I perhaps will see in uh, Omaha in a couple of weeks. Oh, that's where he is. Uh, Jeff and uh, Rima are both in Omaha. Hopefully cool. I meet up with them. If people are getting frustrated with the FDA choosing to wait till June to approve the two drugs together when Moderna is ready now. The two, what, what is Moderna ready with drugs? What is that about, Amy? I don't know. I don't know what the drugs are that Trisha Moderna explained Because Moderna has met vaccines and Pfizer has drugs. So what are you talking about? I don't know. Oh, here we she can for less than five year olds, vaccines. Yes, okay. Well, it, it, I asked Daniel the other day. He doesn't know the reason for this, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that you don't have any insight as to why the FDA is waiting, right, Amy? I have no insight, okay. but Peter Marks has insight, and he's explained it on several podcasts. And actually, I believe he just explained it. Well, let me see. I have to check it out. Because I did not know that uh, Schmigate, uh, which am I calling? <laughs> so there's this Twitter thing called the FDA Biologics. And it uh -huh. says, uh, let's see, it says that Peter Marks is giving, so he's going to talk about the story on young kids and vaccines with just a minute. So I don't know when this just a, a minute is, but it's on their Twitter. Yeah, there he is. It's on their Twitter account. See, there he is. Twi and like, so yeah, there he is talking about vaccines. So everybody can go and listen to what Peter has to say. Okay. You on first name basis with Peter? I've never met Peter. Why would I be on a first name basis with Peter? It just says Peter Marks. So, okay. So yeah, okay. he, he there he explains it. I haven't had a chance to listen to what he said because I've been busy doing other things. But yeah. So uh, everybody loves your shoes. That's great. I love my shoes too. They're Amy's, really bad for Jeff you. Jeff says yeah. Amy's shoes don't make me feel bad for using plastic instead of paper. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. They don't, but they're bad for me. Why is that? Because they really don't have very good support, especially at the arch. Are they meant to be shoes or slippers? No, they're drivers. They're supposed to be the loafers that you use to drive a car. Oh, you're not supposed to be walking around in them. Technically, not every day like I do. But right, So you don't have a car, right? No, why would I need a car? So why do you City. have driving shoes? Because the loafer colors were not good. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So principal manager I mean, it's wants very to clear. know. I was going to say, it's very clear how this this whole thing works. I mean, it's not rocket science here. A PM wants to know, what does it take to get someone like Amy in a position that can make a difference? I'll come up with a position and an offer and we'll let you know. <laughs> are, you, are you having a new position, Amy? Not yet, but, they, but if they come up with an offer, we'll let them know. <laughs> Do you want to tell anyone who it is? Who what is? Uh, you, okay, <laughs> I'm not tonight. I'm following this conversation very clearly. Uh, next week, next week, maybe. As soon, so you're waiting for an official offer letter, and then you will let everyone know where your next job is, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, mm -hmm. folks, that's as close as we're going to get tonight, so you have to come back next week. So that's a, that's a, a hook to get you back <laughs> next week, <laughs> right? Okay. I guess Neva, that's, Neva's is that here like tonight. the cliffhanger of like the soap opera? Yes, the cliffhanger. <laughs> the hello cliffhanger again, Neva. Neva is our friend from Buddha. Ah, yeah, the, that's the Infectious right. Disease podcast or podcast by um, Daniel Griffin and Sarah Dong. And I helped record the first episode tonight. I'll be editing it this weekend. Uh, and uh, next week should come up. Hey, Jeff, who is from Nebraska, said, did anyone see the article that Nebraska had the best overall outcome of the pandemic? Is that true? Or are you joking? 
I don't know. If so, then I'm happy to go to Nebraska in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Where was that, Jeff? Mm. Omaha. Uh -huh. Is it safe to take my two and a half year old grandsons in public since they got COVID last week? Well, now I mean, they have immunity, so yes. They have, uh, they tested positive. Did they have symptoms? <laughs> but yes, it's good. It's good. Well, it's not good that they got sick. No, no, no. But it's, it's good, good I mean, to take them in public. Immunity. Yeah. Uh, here's a question. This is a this is an Amy question. Look at this. Do you believe there are scientific papers with an agenda? Yes. I.e., anti-vax, anti-mask, etc. So I wouldn't say those agendas, right? No, Do there's you... not those agendas. Other there are other agendas. So the anti-vax, the anti-mask people. They, they write manuscripts and and put them out, but they're not really peer-reviewed and published in reputable journals. But there are other, other agendas for sure. And, and if you have a project in your lab, you want to promote it. And sometimes that's the agenda. Is that a fair example, Amy? Well, I don't there... think there's a lot of anti-vax, anti-mask publications from labs because the no. science wouldn't support that. That's a lot. That's a lot of Twitter, and I don't think that Twitter and social media is equal to scientific papers. Usually, you have to, in order to write a scientific paper, you usually have to either do an observational study, so you're a doc, or you have to do some experiments. Right? You can't just write a scientific paper of my idea. Although mm. I guess you could. Um, but there's definitely papers that are published that have it that are done by people that like you and me that have clear agendas and that tend to be wrong. Do you have any examples? I choose to take the fifth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so these agendas are, you know, broad, broad agendas that would affect. Well, like for instance, Flexner had an agenda. His agenda was okay, to good. continue the idea that polio infected people and animals through yeah. the nasal cavity. And he continued to publish after Bodhi and then various other people demonstrated that that was not true. And Bodhi in seminal paper in which he po showed that there was polio variants within extra neural tissue, which included the intestine, right? Yeah. And yeah. Flexner an continued yeah. to push his agenda. He continued to idea. push his agenda in that there was not three serotypes, right? even after Burnett and McNamara and various, which probably caused uh, the March of Dimes and the infantile paralysis, I forget what it's called, um, to continue to do these kind of studies for up to 1955. Yeah, that's a good one. So, yeah. And Peter Duesberg had an agenda that HIV was not the uh, ep ideologic agent of AIDS, right? Correct. Published he published not as many as Flexner, but he published at least one paper trying to demonstrate that. Peter says, for example, an agenda by econo economists who are selective in their meta analysis of effectiveness of lockdowns. Yeah, that would be an agenda, right? Yes, but as I said, I have to take the fifth because my good friend is married to somebody whose mother is an economist and my sister dates an economist economics professor in berkeley so but you also but know she, the lady in georgia too that's paula that's jonathan i just said oh okay when i interviewed her on a twiv she was on twiv yeah, yeah she what's wrote her a name really paula what book. paula stiffen yeah very good twiv about the politics the economics of science yeah <laughs> not the pol not the politics nope Oh, oh, Patricia's reading this book by Michael Lewis. So apparently he was interviewed by Al Franken. That's the book that we that I picked, that then Rich picked, that, that then John Udell discussed. It's like called Promiscuous or Serendipitous or something. Is this, so I think he was interviewed by Al Franken. That was brought up on Twiv yesterday by a listener, I think. Might have been Al a Franken, yeah. the former senator in Minnesota, has a podcast. It may not be a podcast, but Michael Lewis, let's look it up. Michael Lewis, Lewis and Al Franken. Let's see if the two, 
Uh, yeah, alfranken.com. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Michael Lewis on why the U.S. Res COVID response was so crappy. Excellent. Um, the, yeah, so Al Franken podcast, you bet. So that's the thing, Amy. When you get kicked out of the Senate, you make your own podcast, then you, you know, you continue your fame. Well, I'm not clear if he copied Slavit or Slavit copied him. They all copied me. Okay. Well, what no. Senate, what governmental body were you involved in? No, I, no, I, I, but I have done podcasting since two thousand and eight. So yes, I, I know. I have the three all hour these bozos. <laughs> I have the three hour first one that you and Dixon ever made before it ever got released. I I sent it to you to get your opinion, right? Yep. And you said it's too long. Well, it was redundant. <laughs> It was like in a loop, but yeah. Well, that's because uh, we had uh, technical issues. <laughs> As I said, it was a little bit loopy, uh, but it was good. If anyone hasn't gathered, I, uh, Amy is my uh, advisor. If I have questions, I ask her, and and I I depend on her advice because it's always reliable. Well, always it's can... mu right. Aren't we mutual? Don't we do it mutually? It's not a one way street. I hope so. So Jack says there's no recommendation from the USDA that people can take down bird feeders to prevent the spread of high, high path infl avian flu unless they also keep domestic poultry. Okay, that's cool. I, I found an article saying it's a recommendation. But yes, if you have domestic poultry, that would make more sense, right? Yeah, but isn't bird flu segregated to a certain kind of bird? It's not all birds. Yes, that's correct. And I'm not sure that the birds that go to your feeder are necessarily the ones carrying Right, I was going to say there, there's different yeah. kinds of birds. I mean, I'm not yeah. a bird person, but I do believe that. Yeah. Um, I think it was discussed in the bald eagle article that I sent you. The bald, right? Yeah, the bald eagle article, yeah, for sure. Um so here we have, I'd like to know what the recommended period of time between first and second doses and boosters is. Amy, Amy is the expert. So between first and second doses, you should wait no less than eight weeks. And then for a booster, wait no less than six months after your second dose. There you go. You asked, Amy answered. Elena wants to know when you go to Resdora, what do you eat? Oh, that's the place that we went with Tony Guida. Yep. Um, it is. It's amazing. It was amazing. Well, you got something old grandmother, right? Uh, yeah. What did I get? Um, let's see. I'm looking at the menu here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, read it off and I'll tell you what we got. Uh, oh, we, we, we got the cacha pepe. We got the cacha pepe salad to begin with, which was fantastic. Remember that? Yes. Cacha e pepe. It's right here. That was the salad, not the pasta, but the salad with the romaine lettuce. Remember? Oh, yeah. That was good. Um, I don't remember. Uh, they don't have some of the things we had. We had uh, something, a walk in grandmother's garden or something like that. Yeah. What do they yeah, have on the menu? Read oh, that on Pasta page. verde on verde on verde. That wasn't That's green there. on green on green. Yeah, mezzo manique verde, pesto genovese, Tuscan kale, and potato. They didn't have that. Spaghetti with ink. Now, the, the menu is all different from when we went. Unfortunate. Anyway, I think anything you get there is bound to be terrific. It's just fabulous because it's a kind of... It's a northern style cooking, right? Uh, that yeah. most people don't get because most Italian restaurants don't do northern. Excellent. Yes, the worst red sauce ones is that south. Yeah, there was no red sauce in this restaurant, right? No. We could go there again. You want to go there? I have to take you. Oh, I, I can't say it, but I have to take you to dinner for an occasion, right? Yeah. Watch out for the Bon Appetit. Peace on Res Dora. Wow. Oh, that's Bill bon Appetit. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's being it's a magazine. Let's do you see. do you read BA? Of 
course. I don't have a <laughs> subscription, but I do read VA. Yeah. Why? So All Offit right. only recommends second boost for people over 65 with multiple comorbidities. Okay. That's fine. Let's see. Well, anyway, a few people had asked about the Tony Fauci pr proclamation. I don't um, understand it considering the fact he was on um, many of the Sunday news programs and saying that um, the cases are tipping up and we shouldn't give up our vigilance. So I don't really get it. Not really so here's clear what uh, he's talking about. That has a definition, a definition of a pandemic occurring over a wide geographic area. So you can't have a pandemic over in one country. It doesn't make any sense to me, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, I don't know what he's talking about. I mean, I the epidemic, the U.S. epidemic may be subsiding, right? That's fine. But the pandemic not is not over. Clear that it's a, I don't understand how he, I don't understand what, what is... What's the definition of the pandemic? What are we a pandemic of? Are we a pandemic of virus infection or are we a pandemic of disease? Oh, well, that's now you're getting very nuanced. You're <laughs> 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 so getting I very nuanced. I don't so understand. Here's the. Um, I just don't understand. This is a good article, actually, I found in. Um, in Science Magazine. Let me share my screen so that you can see it, okay? When is a pandemic over? Um, apparently every three months, WHO has met to decide if the pandemic should still be a pandemic, and every three months they say yes, and next month the same. But some nations, sometimes they're gonna make a different call. Already nations have functionally declared an end to the pandemic, lifting all restrictions, right? So I well, liked, go ahead. So like today, the the EU came out and said that the emergency portion of the pandemic is over. They didn't okay. say that the pandemic is over. They said that their emergency <laughs> no. portion okay. of the pandemic the is portion. over. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, this part of the program is done. You know, that famous, yeah. that famous line, whatever it is. So... I don't know what that, so I don't know what that really means. Pat. Yeah. I mean, look at the, what this lady said here. Um, uh, what's her, where is she? Here we go. Carolyn Burke says, Bucky, there's not going to be a scientific threshold. There's going to be an opinion based consensus. I think that's it. There's no scientific threshold. So um, you can't, you can't say it's over in a single country, but people will. So Tony Fauci did, but I don't think that's really. Can I use the word tref? What is it? Traif, kosher? Traif, non-kosher? Non-kosher. <laughs> non-kosher, you want to say it's traif? A, a letter traif. from a listener of TWIV, I, I learned the word traif. Traif or traif? Traif. Traif. It's T-R-E-Y-F, traif. Okay, I learned that word. It means non-kosher. Amy explained to me what it meant today. It means non-kosher. You can't put traif on a bagel. So the lady was living in Rochester. She said they have a great bagel store, except that they make one dish, which is a hot dog wrapped in a bagel. And she said, very trafe. <laughs> exactly. And they said they also make... Cream cheese, honey, bacon, cream cheese. Yeah, which is also or maple, very trafe. Uh, maple, bacon, cream you cheese. You put it on a bagel. Yeah, anyway. What would have to, have to, have to happen for the virus to be called SARS-CoV-3? Have to be a new virus. Yeah, new new virus, a new spillover from bats somewhere. Right, Amy? Uh huh. Are you tired? I'm a little tired, yeah. I Tell people how well. many hours of sleep you get every night. Continuous hours of sleep, or can yeah. I just. Okay. So, continuous hours of sleep, I get three. If I'm. You can't, you can't function on those number but, of hours. Okay. But that's continuous hours. So, this is how it works. You get into bed at midnight. You look at the ceiling until about 12.45, 1 o'clock. Then you fall asleep. Then you get up at 3.15 for whatever reason. And then you're up till about 4.30. And then you fall back asleep at 4.30. And then you get out of bed on those days at 6.15. And you call it a day. 
and then you try again tomorrow. I think you need to figure out how to sleep better. Me too. How did the right wing hijack the false principle that vaccines are ineffective if a person gets infected but survives? It's not just the right wing. It's the press who, and many pundits who don't understand that that's the way vaccines work. And we've talked about this for two years now. And since we have a very small following, you know, it hasn't percolated. Percolated? But that's, you know, the right wing will hijack whatever they want to fit their agenda, right? Yes. Did you read about China recording the first human infection with H3N8 avian influenza? Yes, I saw that. Um, it's not it's not surprising because many avian uh, influenza strains originate in China. They, they have a lot of chickens and other birds uh, that are used for agriculture, and uh, they're close to people. So whether or not it's going to propagate in people or not, we don't know. I don't know. But here's this. So we talked about my sleep pattern. So Vanity Nutrition says, oh, my God, that's horrible sleep. And Russell John says, M I need more wine. Well, I'm out of wine. So anybody who wants to send me more wine to help me sleep, send me more wine. I can send you wine to help you sleep. <laughs> I have a wine <laughs> store under the incubator. I'll get you some wine and bring it up no, no, on uh, Friday, okay? This is what I heard about the bagels. Oh, I'll bring you a bagel to test out the bagel store. And I had to go all the way down myself. Are you saying I make end. false promises? I'm not saying anything. We get distracted. Okay, so more clarification from Jack. There's a very low risk of an outbreak of bird flu among songbirds, according to the USDA. Domestic poultry are at risk. That's correct. Thank you very much. Right, but I don't think your sparrow in your uh, bird feeder is a domestic no. poultry. I don't but you know, sparrow poultry. have avian malaria. Yes, I know. They give it to the animals in the zoo, the penguins, right? The penguins. Penguins. Okay, Rob didn't says. You, didn't you and Daniel and Dixon go to the zoo to learn about that? Yeah, we did. On no, Twitch? folks, uh, I know a lot of you here don't listen to our pods, but once we went to the Bronx Zoo and the director, this guy's the director of all the zoos in New York City. What's his name? Okay. Director, zoo director, zoo director man. <laughs> NYC zoo director. Why don't you just look up pod? Why don't you just look up TWIP Bronx Zoo? That would be easier. <laughs> what a great idea. TWIP <laughs> Bronx. So while you're complaining about how people don't listen to your, your podcast, you Paul yourself. <laughs> Paul Cali, P-A-U-L-C-A-L-L-E. He is the head of... Uh, the uh, what is the conservation thing in New York? Um, I can't remember. Paul Cowley is the is the uh, is the head of all the wildlife stuff in New York City. Anyway, why did I say anyway? We did a pod with him because he had some penguins that got malaria, and they got it from the sparrows that are in the zoo. Okay, so Rob wants to know what advantage could a pathogenic virus obtain by forming a biofilm with fungus in a hospitalized setting? It's hard to remove. Biofilms are very hard to disrupt. They're the by the bacteria, if they were antibiotic sensitive, become resistant. Once you're and what the about the viruses? Maybe it just gets trapped in there. Right? Yeah, it gets trapped in there. I'm not sure yeah. it has any advantage to the virus, Rob being trapped by it by those fungi films well they're yeah some of them are bacteria the bacteria form the biofilm or the fungus is forming the biofilm? both both, both can form the bunk well i mean you should know aaron was here for many years and worked on the biofilm of canada and then bonnie basler worked That's on the right. biofilm of bacteria the uh canada made biofilms That's right yeah it's um, all covered in your shunt and gives you thrush that's why you get all that white goo are there flu viruses with all possible H and N combinations? Yes. So in nature, you can get, there are uh, 18 H's and 11 N's. And uh, you can find all combinations in nature. But it, the ones that infect people and cause outbreaks are H1, 
one H2 and H3. That's it. None of the other H's cause outbreaks in people or part of viruses that cause outbreak in people. Yeah. Does the booster do anything besides temporarily give some immunity? <laughs> Does no. it boost the memory T and B cells? Well, you can do, are you going to talk about uh, Theodora and Nusenswigs and Paul's recent uh, nature paper that discusses that? Is that one that you sent me? Yeah, I sent it like Sunday. Would you, would you like to do it on Friday? I thought you had non-COVID days. Yeah, we could do it on Friday, whatever you want. Maybe he's going to be on TWIV on Friday. So this, they address this question, period. right? They yeah, address this they question, did. yeah. Yeah. And the answer is yes, right? Yeah. Does give some boost, yeah. That's not clear that it is of any advantage to most people, though. That's the thing. It's not really clear uh, that it makes a difference in, 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 you know, it really makes any biological or clinical difference. Yeah, I agree to that. It's time to write your own theme song. Well, I can't write a song. Um, I think um, it would be nice if someone wrote a song for us for our pods, but no one's going to do that. I borrow from Ronald Jenkins. He's I write him. He says, yeah, you can use my music. So I give him some money and we use it. Hey, Rico is back. Thank you for your support. What are your expectations for H3N8? I it's think gonna, it's going to... Go ahead. Go sorry. Ahead. No, 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 no. no. You spoke first. Go. Uh, I think it's not really transmitting through from person to person. So I think it's going to pretty much die out. Yeah, I would. I, I think it's going to be multi, probably you know spillovers now and then from from poultry or from birds of various kinds into people, but they're not going to establish chains of infection. Um, there have been other H N combinations coming out of birds, right? But don't really go very far. So I I expect it'll be the same. Yeah, isn't that what happens with influenza B or something? You know, influenza that... B transmits very well. We have that's why we have vaccines against influenza B. But many, you know, the H's, except for one, two, and three, um, now this is an H3, right? So, but it's an avian H3, so it's not well adapted to humans. Yeah, There's, yeah I think it's just going to, I think it's, you'll, you'll call it, you and I will differ because you'll call it a short transmission train and I'll, chain and I'll look at you and go, what? <laughs> Well, there are, there are differences. They're short chains and they're long chains, right? Well, right, but I don't think that they're really. I don't think that they're really short chains. I think like that they're. I think that those events usually are are consequences of of unique individual spillover events, like that somebody was next to. Karen wants to know what you mean by rescuing a virus, as mentioned in a recent TWIV. I, I suspect you, you when you transfect RNA into cells, viral RNA into cells, and you, you get virus out. That's what we call rescuing a virus. What do you think about that, Amy? Sounds good. We do it all the time. Yeah. Amy does it a lot. She makes RNA transcripts. She puts them in cells and gets viruses out. Mm -hmm. Henry says, what about mouse pox and other emerging viral threats? So that's in relationship to the New York Times article that I sent you from the guy about the, that Zimmer just wrote about the, uh, the by about the biologist like in Georgia. It's not even clear to me that he's actually a biologist. It's uh, a computational right? scientist, right? Yeah, that's what it seems to me. And so he's trying to predict what uh, are going to be viral threats from like looking at sequence analysis, and I'm not really clear that that's something you can do reliably yeah. but they in there but emmy dewitt is in there and she's like she's kind of hidden in there and she's kind of like it might have potential but you know i think you can't really use computational approaches to predict what is going to be a, an emerging threat i think you have to do experiments and even at that yeah. amy would argue that that's not going to tell you everything well i will argue that that's bias and it's not correct but um so 
Uh, recently, there was another. So recently, a group I saw on BioArchives this morning. I forgot where the group is. It's like I think it's out of the country, but they basically used Ian's technology of like VRSeq to yeah. identify novel coronas. I mean, it really just went to prove Ian's point that like just shotgun sequencing without some kind of enrichment, you really can't find very much. Mm -hmm. But if you do, but if you do a capture where you have a bias, you know, you take advantage yeah. of, yeah. yeah, you can find more, you can easily find things. Yeah. I think these kinds of articles are, you know, they, they seem appealing in this context with when we're in a pandemic, but in reality, we can't predict. We don't know which viruses are going to be problematic. Even when we do experiments in the laboratory, we can't predict. It's very hard. Yeah. So I think that these kinds of articles are a negative during these kind of pandemic and during a pandemic. I think they're only published to sell newspapers and shock value and to continue to scare people yeah, because I they're agree. published in that fashion, in an overtone of, uh, be aware, you know, when you should hear that 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 horror movie music of don't open the next door. You don't know what's behind it. But Zimmer would say to you, it has to be explored. We could say whatever he wants to me. He's allowed to have his opinion and I'm allowed to have my opinion. And then there's okay. the right opinion, which is not his opinion. <laughs> Okay, I like that. <laughs> so it's all fine. Everybody had an opinion. Jeff wants to know, is there an advantage for a virus that forms syncytia yes. compared to cell-to-cell -cell movement? What do you think is the advantage, Amy? Immune evasion. You're not seen by the immune cell. So the particles are not extracellular, right? Right. That's the They're idea. Hidden. right there. But, but the many viruses do not make syncytia. Poliovirus does not. So... Obviously, you can get around that issue. Right? Well, I didn't say that you had to. I just said that's the idea, right? I don't know. I think that's the idea, but I'm not sure that that's actually. It's just another, in my opinion, as Jeff says, I think it's another mechanism that works. I don't think there's any selection, but we're not going to get an answer to that one. Thank you, Doreen, for your contribution. They're on a flight masked, and the person next is blowing the nose and coughing unmasked. Common sense, still not epidemic. Of course not. Of course not. How many people on the flight are masked? Maybe 30%, Doreen? I'm guessing. Okay, aardvark. Interesting spelling of aardvark, isn't it? It's cool. Do you know what an aardvark is, uh, Amy? Is it an anteater? I think so. 20% of the people infected with covid no, they're not infected with COVID. They're infected with SARS-CoV-2 to do most of the transmitting. What determines this? I don't know. I said once and Amy didn't like my answer, so I'm not saying it again. <laughs> I think it's because they shed more infectious virus. But we don't know because you know, very few studies have measured. And in fact, none have measured shedding in the super spreading events. So we don't know. It's all speculation. I don't think that they necessarily need to shed more virus. So what else do you think could do it? Tell me. They could shed longer. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, the person who they're, who they're in contact with could be immune compromised. Yeah, so multiple reasons. There's not necessarily just one reason. I don't think there is one reason for many things. Yep. As you just finished saying, you do what works, right? It's good enough. Are you going to restart your agriculture podcast with Dixon? No, 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 no. no that, that, let me tell you, that was the one pod that someone else had to do the, the legwork, which means getting guests and scheduling topics. Not me. Dixon was supposed to do that. Didn't happen. End of story. I'm not, I can't do it. It's not my field. He complained that and no Dixon one wanted to come is, on. Yeah, but Dixon's also much older and sick. Well, now he's sick, but 10 years ago, five years ago, he wasn't sick. Yeah, I, I know. Mean, it's fine. It went, it had its useful life. We did some good pods, but no, we're not going to do that because 
Um, well, unless someone in the field wants to do it with me, we'll produce it for them, sure. Uh, so people are saying v weekly. Okay, we can do weekly. Okay. Here's your buddy, uh, Amy. Animal Party is here. I know. It's Jen. Is that a, yeah. is that a um, aardvark? What, what is that no, animal? No, it's a cat. I think it's, it's a cat. cat. It doesn't look like so. a cat. Oh, my gosh. I think it's a cat or a duck. It's very cute. She got it. So she sent me these really cool pictures of where she was on location, and then she decided to go back to school. It's very cool. <laughs> but an A&V cooking show? No way. There are plenty of cooking shows on the web. You can go watch them. Look at Cuore di Chocolato. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. What is but, it? Just about how to make chocolate? No, it's an Italian guy who is very personable, who makes all kinds of foods, not just chocolate. But um, So how was your good. Julia Child show? I didn't see much of it. I only saw bits and pieces of episode one because uh, I think it was free on something or other. It looked good, but I'm not going to watch it because I don't subscribe to um, whatever thing it's on. I don't subscribe to it. Does it? Oh, I'll keep watching weekly as long as you keep answering questions. This is why we would be here. We wouldn't be here just to song and dance, right? Um, Dan says, does it bother you that Fauci says we're transitioning into a more controlled endemicity? <laughs> I don't know what that means. Yeah, well, More controlled than domestic. Who knows what, I don't that, know means. what that means? Who knows what that means? Ridiculous. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what it means. It's All right, a, it's, it's eight forty-six. So, like three more, and then I have to go. Okay, Pamela, thank you so much for your contribution. That's very restraint. Nice. Well, thank you. Very generous. Restu I don't know if I have restraint, but thank you for thinking so much. <laughs> Well, I don't. I don't pretend to. You don't pretend to have restraint? No. I don't pretend to be anything that I am not. Okay. Would you take Pax Lovid? Yeah, I would take. Uh, I, I asked Dan Daniel about the rebound. Um. I don't think I asked him last week. This week we have a question about it. I'm going to let him answer that. I, I just don't think. Have you heard about these, Amy? Where Open they takes... take Paxlovid and like three minutes later they feel 100% better? Yeah, but then they get sick again. Uh... So I, I don't know what to make of those. I, I got Daniel answering it tomorrow. I don't know. Well, what to make. when do they get sick again? Like the next day, they have more severe symptoms, or Let's like look it up. three weeks from now. Let's look it up. Might as well do it here. <clears throat> I'm just curious. Patients report rebound of COVID. This is from Stat News. Which is, oh, which, I see a scientific journal. Uh, it's not. It's you know not a journal, but of course they've closed the article to me. Nice. Okay, well, we can wait for time, yeah. Puzzling phenomenon, rebound of COVID symptoms. Oh, all these advertisements, stop it. For gosh sakes. Um, after finishing the five-day course, they feel better and then test positive again a few days later. Oh, that's just BS. The testing positive. That's what is, is called a rebound case is because they yeah. test positive. It is, it's... Well, that, and they test positive, what, by PCR or by antigen? I'm sorry, I closed the window. Do you want me to look it up? No, no, no. I'm sure they're not mm -hmm. going to tell us. No, they no, test no. Positive I don't need again. To know. Scientists are trying to understand what might be fueling the problem. Stupidity. <laughs> Maybe their internet is out, Amy. <laughs> well, I mean, if they're testing positive by PCR, of course they're going to test positive again. You have remnants yeah. of RNA that hang out. So I don't know why this is like called a rebound case. I don't get it. Yeah, I, I don't think much of it. Um, I just don't, I, I just don't have enough information. I don't quite get it. Yeah, Marina, I don't think much of it. All right, let's see here. Three more and then I have to go. 
It's time to do Eliza. It's time to wash more Eliza. All right, so John gives us some numbers. Weekly update, New York Times, seven-day average death, 338, 426, uh, April 26th That was the yesterday. US. And here. The Minnesota uh, Department of Health. So, so the numbers are down. That's the point. Fauci is saying, you know, numbers are down all around and in the U.S. And so we're, that's what he calls being out of the pandemic. But technically, it's not correct. We are, the epidemic is subsiding in the U.S. Let's put it that way. Would that be but fair? But let's Amy? put it this way. Yeah, but let's put it this way. Okay. Last year, he said the same thing because it was summer, more people went outside, there was greater social dis physical distancing, blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you're telling me the same story. Okay, so I'm not really that excited by this because that's what's anticipated. It's always anticipated that during the warm months, the numbers reduce, right? because yep. you're yep. more physically distant. So come back to me next Christmas and let me know where those numbers are. Well, it's, when we have these epidemics of flu, they're epidemics, they're not pandemics, right? So it'll be an epidemic because it's probably not going to be in ev multiple countries globally, especially the Well, I don't countries. know. So that's the question, right? I am yeah, not right. willing right. to make any bet because there's still a lot of the, con a lot of the world that isn't vaccinated or fully vaccinated. Yeah. Yep. So I'm not clear what we're discussing. So far, what we've called a reduction and out of the, the whatever, the hazard is what we said last year because it was summer. So I don't really understand what, what I'm, I don't really understand. I'm not getting it. Okay. Per recent TWIVs and Daniel, there seemed to be a suggestion that either via new COVID VOCs or Omicron, there's a possibility of ADE. No, not the vaccines. There, no. What we discussed, and I think Amy was on the episode, was that- Yeah, I was. Some it was infection. It was antibodies actually allow FC-mediated infection, right? Correct? Yeah, but yes, it was. there was a difference in fusillation of the of the of the backbone of the FC component of the antibody. Ah, in and, certain patients, the, right? Yeah. Right. In certain patients, the fusillation went one way. And then when you vac looked at vaccination, it went the opposite way. Didn't make very right. much sense. So fucosylation, a sugar modification of the FC, which would allow it to bind to FC receptors on certain immune cells and then get taken up, the virus would reproduce and possibly leading to severe COVID. So that's in natural infection, not in vaccines. That's an important point. It doesn't happen in after vaccination. It just happens uh, after infection. So right, what, which makes it wonder what is, why that there is a difference in mechanism of uh, assembly of the antibody in response to a vaccine versus a natural infection. Um, okay, well, last there, one. Is there any ribosome shunting or iris in SARS-CoV-2? Frame shifting. There's frame shifting, right. Ribosome shunting only occurs on the major late promoter of adenovirus, and iris is really occurring uh, picornis. Have one more? Okay, one more. Amy, how do you feel about the womb chair? I like the womb chair, but not as much as my egg chair or the Pelican chair, but I do like the womb chair. We tried to look at it for you, but it was it was too wide. It wouldn't have fit in the okay. space. One more. But, Did you yeah. see the Times okay. op-ed criticizing the FDA? What do you think about it? I'm sure you've seen this because I didn't look at it. Yeah, I saw it. Um, I don't agree with the position. Okay. That the uh, that the author took, I think. Um, I think that there's a lot more that goes into a decision than what she took, um, than what she took, uh, and what she portrayed. And I think that there's a lot of. I think that there is. Um, too much emphasis on antibodies, and so if you just go by antibody numbers, then it doesn't look so good. But if you then read like how John Wary sent a whole letter with uh, like 84 other immunologists to the FDA saying that 
we needed to establish uh we needed to establish protocols that took a that took into account T cell responses and stuff. Mm-hmm. Then um you would have you would have a better thing. So I think that whoever wrote the the op ed was a bit hasty. Well, they get a lot of attention, as you know, and that's the point, right? Did you yeah, well, get somebody a lot of always has to. Be, uh, yeah, but some. Yeah, but somebody always has to be the bad guy, and it's easy to complain about the FDA because they're always in the bad guy, right? Because they're mm-hmm. going. They're the ones who regulate drugs and stuff, and so you know, they are never going to win. So either you made it too conservative and you can't get your drug passed or you made it too liberal and then the drug either doesn't A, do what it's supposed to do or B, lots of people die, right? Yeah. So they're always going to be the bad guy. So Amy and I wrote an op-ed last year in the New York Times. Maybe some of you don't know that. You could go search for it and read it. We were making the argument last year that we shouldn't be testing. Yep. Especially vaccinated. Yeah, we people. made the argument that the variants were not really anything but human behavior, and then I wrote a separate piece. Oh, you for wrote a blog. blog yeah, sorry, that's about right. The, not testing. The Times was all about uh, transmission by human behavior. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. like stop calling the variants and more transmissible or more infectious because okay. you really don't have any data that says that. All right, Amy, off to cells. Off to Eliza's. All Eliza's right. today. We got Thank a pipette. We got to you know, more pipetting. Thank you for joining right, us I'll this talk evening. To you tomorrow. Yes, My indeed. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I Good forgot. Night. Oh, wait. What? There's no time for me tomorrow. You got too many podcasts. You're going to have to cut one out. I usually get right. 50 texts from you a day. There's always time. Yeah, I know, because I read a lot. I read bye. a lot. There, Good night. Bye. I hope Good you night. sleep four hours tonight. I didn't exercise, so most likely no, but oh. yeah. Sorry. All right. We'll bye. try again. Bye. <laughs> All right. Back to the task at hand. In a twiv last summer, we recalled dismissing a paper that says SARS 2 retrotranscribes into the genome. Can you repeat why this is unlikely? All right, so some the, the first uh, report was a sequencing artifact for sure. I think that was even published in PNAS, but the authors repeated the study. Others did. And here's the, the observation. You take a cell line which produces reverse transcriptase at higher than normal levels. Of course, reverse transcriptase is the enzyme that copies RNA into DNA. And then you put... You can infect those cells with SARS-CoV-2, and you can see that the RNA is reverse transcribed into DNA, uh, and there's some integration uh, into the host cell. But it's an artificial situation because you're overproducing the, uh, the reverse transcriptase. So that would happen with any RNA that you put into those cells. Now, your cells have a lot of mRNA in them, and periodically they are reverse transcribed and periodically get integrated with mostly no consequence. And so, you know, your cells are full of mRNA, and and on top of it, the virus is killing the cells, so it's not at all clear if this did happen that it would be an issue, either with a virus infection or vaccination with an mRNA vaccine. Now, some people have said, aha, this explains why people test positive for months by PCR because the the viral DNA copy is integrated into the host cell and the cell is just churning out. I just don't, there's no evidence for that. I mean, you could think that that may be what's happening, but there's no experimental evidence, save for this highly um, artificial cell culture result. And so I think this, the virus killing the cells is going to get rid of that for the most part. Most of the cells are, are lysed by virus infection. And so that's not going to explain long-term positivity. Or they say, okay, maybe it could integrate and disrupt the gene. Yeah, but so could every other mRNA that's in our cell could integrate if it's copied the DNA. And that rarely happens. So I don't think these are realistic concerns based on all of that. Okay, there you go.
Uh, do we know anything about the persistent thick copious mucus forms of long COVID? I do not. I've never heard, which is not to say that it doesn't exist, okay? And I will be the first to admit. Um, but I have not heard Daniel. Daniel is my source on clinical issues. I've never heard him mention it. It could certainly be happen, happening, right? Uh, perhaps at a low level and hasn't gone, uh, it's under the radar. But I'm not aware of it. Sorry. Thank you, D. Goodall, for your contribution. Really appreciate your support of uh, the incubator. Your your contributions go towards uh, the uh, the recording studio that we call the incubator. And by the way, Elena earlier asked, "What's up with the incubator?" Um, I am almost f never going to be finished, but with the physical space, I'm almost finished with sound panels. I I, I just got some shelves in. And this is going to be a project because I have to put the, the brackets on the walls. And I, I have to do this bef before May. So, yes, it's not quite done yet. And on any given day, there are a lot of empty boxes around and <laughs> I have to get rid of them. So I would say maybe in a couple of weeks, most of it will be done. Um, the main thing that has to be done now is to put up the shelves, the sound, some of the sound panels. It's not a lot of work. I ordered the wrong sound panels, the wrong color, so I had to reorder them. Otherwise, that would have been done. And uh, one more thing. What is the – oh, the re, I have some pictures I have to put up as well. <laughs> All right. Here's a real method question. I'm using P1 phage. We're looking at top auger or normal spreading protocols. And I'm wondering if top is generally accepted. So when I used to do phage, I used top auger. You would mix the, the phage and the bacteria in the top auger and then pour it out over the plate and, and spread it out and let it solidify and turn it over and put it in the incubator. But I think spreading can work as well. And, you know, you have your little plate turner. You put it on and spin it around with your glass spreader. Sure, both work. I've done both. But, you know, you're going to ask 10 people, you get 10 different answers probably. So a person can have a positive test without being sick with COVID. Yay, vaccines. Exactly right. You can even be positive without being sick and, and not have been vaccinated. So before we had vaccines, that happened. But now this is converting many infections into asymptomatic infections. Yeah, for sure. Any thoughts on why African countries are faring better with an infection-induced herd immunity? I think there's, I'm not sure they're faring better. I think there's a lot of underreporting uh, in many countries. And I wouldn't depend on infection-induced immunity to continue that, right? I think that their goal is to get more people vaccinated. That's They're going to have w multiple waves of infection if they don't. Yes, the vice president's doctor prescribed Paxlovid, which is no one's business. And you can have... Paxlovid if you test positive. Right. I know many, many young people who test positive and they get Paxlovid. You're right to have it. Um, and the vice president, I suppose, you're taking a precaution that you don't want it to proceed, right? So you get Paxlovid. And um, so what could happen? You know, the vaccine is really good, but it's not 100%. You could develop serious disease. And the percentage depends on where you are and what study has been done in that country. Um, so that's they're just taking a precaution with it. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that because many other people are getting Paxlovid as well, right? Should it be called asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection and not asymptomatic COVID? Yes. Good pedantic point. That's great. I like it. Um, yeah, it's an asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection. COVID is a disease, right? Symptoms. So you can't have asymptomatic COVID. It's a, What would that word be? An oxymoron or something? Yeah, but you're right, Barb. Listen to Barb Mack, folks. She's got it. Asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2. But no one's going to call it that because it takes too long to get off the tongue, right? Uh, what does the most recent scholarship say about long covid I think the best scholarship 
suggests that it could at least some of it. And remember, um, there's never one answer for everything. So long COVID is going to end up having multiple answers, but at least one is possibly an autoimmune disease. And we did a paper today on immune, which partially addresses this. There's a paper about a set of T cells in us that are whose job it is to control autoimmune reactions. And so when you get an infection, some of the antibodies that are made cross-react with your tissues. If you have those T cells in you that are self-reactive. So they found that these suppressor T cells are higher in people with severe COVID. We don't know about long COVID. That's the next study, I'm sure. But if it's the case, if these suppressors are elevated, then that would, and maybe they're not working well, as Cindy Leifer said, maybe they suck at their job, uh, then maybe we could figure out ways to stimulate them and maybe resolve COVID that way. So I think we're going to sort a lot of this out, you know, in the next years. It's going to take a while, but there are a lot of tantalizing hints like that. Uh, do you think Dr. Griffin would have administered her Paxlovid, which the VP... Yeah, 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 I think he would have if he were her physician. Sure, why not? I mean, as I said, every, every day people get Paxlovid and they're not symptomatic and they're young and healthy, so why not? Sure. What is it about the African some cross-protection? I don't think so. I, th I don't know the answer, uh, Russell. It's a good question. It could very well be that there's some reporting issues going on. I'm always suspicious of observational numbers, right? You can get you can get <laughs> numbers differing huge at both ends of the spectrum from different studies in different countries. So right now, you can find studies that say, you know, three vaccine doses after six months don't give you more than sixty percent protection against hospitalization with Omicron. Right? In one study, in another study, you can find it at eighty percent, eighty percent. So you cannot go by any one study. I learned that from Richard Plemper a couple of weeks ago on Twitter. He talked about molnupiravir. You can't take any one study as dogma for the world. You have to be very specific at the population that's related to you. So even if a study is done in California, it may not apply to New York or the Eastern Coast. So I don't know what the study, what the issue is, Russell. There's something going on there, obviously. Uh, so we addressed this earlier, but I don't know what's going on. Uh, it could be more sensitive reporting, right? These cases have always been there, but we never saw them. Now we're looking harder at anything viral. <laughs> you can imagine why. Or it could be that uh, the virus has somehow emerged as a different pathogen, but we don't know. Uh, what do I think? I don't think it's merged as a new pathogen. I think it's uh, a reporting issue, but we'll we'll certainly see. Yeah. Ah, oh, why did we evolve reverse transcriptases? <coughs> well, this is a good question. Now, I have to say, Kevin, uh, last week I was at a Cold Spring Harbor meeting. Um, which was celebrating 52 years of reverse transcriptase. So I did a, a podcast with David Baltimore, who was one of the co-discoverers of reverse transcriptase. The other, Howard Tam and his dad, of course. Uh, uh, John Coffin and uh, Harold Varmus. So I asked David, did reverse transcriptase uh, come about before cells before viruses and could it have been responsible for the transition of the RNA to the DNA world? He said, sure, but there could be also other explanations. So the idea is that a long time ago, there was an RNA world where, where living things were based on RNA. There was no DNA. And in that era, you know, proteins evolved and perhaps early cells. And then maybe an enzyme evolved, reverse transcriptase, which derived from the enzymes that copy RNA. It doesn't take much to change an enzyme that copies RNA to RNA into one that copies RNA to DNA. And so that could happen randomly. And then boom, you have a enzyme that 
copies RNA to DNA, and then all things are possible. Big cells are now possible with DNA genomes. So I, I think that's a likely selection for reverse transcriptase because it enables all these uh, large cells to be produced. And then, so it's present in most cells, as far as we know, reverse transcriptase. And so then retroviruses pick it up as they're evolving. So I, I don't think retroviruses invented it. No. <laughs> What assumptions uh, that many scientists na made initially about SARS-CoV-2 have been turned out to be correct or wrong? Well, I'm afraid of, I'm, I'm just going to give you a couple here because um, I, I would need to s think seriously for a while to sort it all out. And, you know, we have talked about a lot of it over the, the two years on Twitter. I could go back and look at various episodes. So... One one thing we didn't, and I'm not sure this is a mistake, but we didn't know that this virus would undergo antigenic variation, which it has been doing. And the reason we didn't is because SARS-1 and MERS don't do antigenic variation. And we thought the common cold coronas didn't, but we never actually looked. And at the beginning of the pandemic, it was looked at. Um, and um, we found that common cold coronas do undergo antigenic variation. And lo and behold, the SARS-CoV-2 does the same thing. And so this has been a problem, right? Because um, as it, the virus changes in the spike in particular, it uh, becomes better at not being neutralized by antibodies. Now, I think one of the mistakes was that we thought antibodies would be essential for preventing infection, which they are, but we didn't take into account the, the reality, which is the case for all infections and vaccinations, that antibody levels contract after infection, after infection and vaccination, and that you will be infected and perhaps have moderate disease until the um, memory response kicks in. Um, and so we thought the antibodies, the memory response would take care of all of it, but it turns out that it's probably more than just the memory response as well. Um, I think in terms of biology, we're still working out what's going on with all the variants. But, you know, as I mentioned ad nauseum probably early on, the, what gives the enhanced fitness of the variants such that they displace one after another was uh, was is not known. And, and many people claim they knew. And then we get to Omicron where it's very clear that immune evasion is the basis for its enhanced fitness, not an intrinsic better transmissibility. It's evading antibodies. So those are some of the things that I have followed that. And I think it's a good question because I would like to write at some point a piece that goes through all of these assumptions and what we got right and not from a scientific perspective. I do want to talk about what we got wrong in terms of control. And I want to do that with Steve Morse from Columbia at some point. <clears throat> Do vaccines still cause virus neutralization? Because despite poorly binding antibodies, they overwhelm virus with sheer numbers. No, uh, actually, so if you are vaccinated twice with a three to four week interval between doses, your serum cannot neutralize Omicron. Yet, it still can, you still are somewhat protected against severe disease, not great numbers, maybe 60%-ish, depending on the study. And that's probably because T cells are preventing severe disease from occurring. So the, the so the antibodies don't overwhelm, no, with sheer numbers. They're still, they bind poor, they don't bind to the virus, so they can't overwhelm them. And that's because of all the changes in the Omicron spike, right? Do the RNA vaccines have mRNA vaccines in... Luis is clearly French, acid, <laughs> ribonucleotide. Um, uh, yes, they have five prime untranslated regions, yeah. Under five-year-olds will eventually be given protein instead of RNA. No, not necessarily. I think you'll have an option, but they're going to have uh, mRNA vaccines available as well. What do you think is happening with Influenza. 
Well, this season is very unusual. Have you seen uh, what's going on? Let's take a look at uh, CDC flu website, okay? Because the graphs are pretty cool. Uh, flu activity here. Let's let's get it. Let's get at the graph here. I saw this the other day, and it was pretty cool. Look, not not cool. I'm sorry. I'm saying cool from a scientific viewpoint. But of course, if you were sick, it's not cool. Here. Uh, where's my screen share? There you go. I'll get rid of this comment. So look at this. Influenza positive test from October to April 16th. So we had a, a bump, a peak in um, 2021, week 50. So that's December, right? 51 was the peak. And then it went down and it went to the lowest point in uh, week week five so february and then it started going up again and now the the last week it went down a little bit so we had two waves look at that that's very unusual what's going on here i really don't know they don't they don't, they don't do any speculating they're just reporting the results here on the website um what's going on so we have and and you know this is a uh, smaller than is it a smaller than usual uh, these these percent positives look about normal to me we could actually look at a historical uh, uh, record here to, to confirm that but why we had this second wave i'm not sure i think a lot of people were not immune due to the previous social uh, physical distancing and so forth and it may be that those people are they're constituting the second wave. I don't think we understand that, though. Quite interesting, right? Really cool. Uh, is If the next flu pandemic comes soon, what about it might look different from this one? It might, what might look similar. So you know, flu pandemics vary depending on the virus that's causing them, right? So 2009, the last one we had, was relatively mild. 1968, H3N2 was, was uh, not so mild. Um, so depends on the virus and, you know, you have similar global outbreaks, va very rapid spread, a lot of cases, a lot of, uh, illnesses and death. But remember our testing capacity now is the best it's ever been and sequencing capacity. So we've never had that for the for flu for during a pandemic. I mean 2009 wasn't bad, but we're going to have much more capacity and we're going to do more testing and so forth. So um, we're going to see similar numbers, but the difference is we have we have a flu vaccine which we can modify very quickly. It won't take a year. It will take less than a year to get vaccines at the end. We we also have antivirals, so it, we will be able to control it a lot easier than currently. So I think those are those are some of the ways that we can look at that. Is long COVID related to severity of attack, number of vaccinations, use of antivirals? My understanding is long COVID can occur with mild cases and severe cases. It can occur in people who have been vaccinated, although the frequency is not clear to me. I don't think the numbers are good so far. Um, whether antivirals can impact it is a good question. So if you get tested positive and you take an antiviral, is that going to prevent long COVID? We don't know because the antivirals have just come online recently, right? So we don't have long periods of time to say long COVID yet. So I think that's an interesting question. And the other is, if you have long COVID and you get an antiviral, is that going to help? I suspect not because I'm not it's not clear to me that there's virus persisting in long COVID. I think it's a uh, it's an immunological issue that you have after the virus is gone, but it's worth trying, and some people are going to be doing that for sure. Who should you listen for solid advice regarding long COVID? So there is a, um, a very good journalist, Fiona, Fiona Lowenstein, who has long COVID herself and has put together a long COVID support group. So you can look her up. She's on social media. And she speaks very highly of the Mount Sinai team that uh, has a, a long COVID clinic. So if you look her up, you will find the information to uh, 
to see about that. Fiona Lowenstein, okay? Had a twiv with her once. Let's look it up. Fiona Lowenstein twiv. 680. Here it is. Uh, let's let's put it up here so you can see it so you can um Ah, there it is, long COVID and MECFS. So here we have, uh, there's Fiona with the arrow in front of her. Right, so her her um, the link is there in, in her name. You can see Fiona Lois and you can click on it and find her stuff. Ah, that's when I was doing all the twivs at home. Look at that. Wow, long time ago. Uh, where would we be if there were no vaccines and antivirals? I'm talking about virological prospect variants etc well uh, if there were if there were no vaccines you know eventually this this pandemic would end as i always say to people we had a 1918 horrible flu pandemic and it ended without any vaccines and so eventually this one would end also by having more people infected and consequently dying that's uh, many many more people were infected in 1918 and that generates the immunity that you need so it it's accompanied with many, many more millions of deaths. So it's not a good thing to do. So would you have variants? Yes, because any kind of immunity selects for variants, for sure. It doesn't have to be vaccine-induced. It can be infection-induced as well. Is it possible to create vaccines for viruses that cause ADE? Or would the vax cause ADE just like infection? Okay, so let's say, let's use dengue as an example. You have four serotypes, and if you get infected with serotype 1, you, you survive infection. You now have antibodies and memory to serotype 1 dengue. Then you get infected the next year with serotype 2. You make your anti-serotype 1 antibodies. Your memory response does that. They will bind to the serotype 2 that infected you, but they will not neutralize it. That's the definition of a different serotype. So then the antibodies allow the virus to get into cells with FC receptors and you get a more severe dengue. So that's what happens after infection. The, so the, the problem is if you have only antibodies to one serotype. So if a vaccine made antibodies to all four, then no matter which serotype you got infected with, you would make antibodies against that one that would neutralize it. So you wouldn't have this issue of antibody-dependent uh, enhancement. Um, and so the one dengue vaccine we have, Dengvaxia, unfortunately doesn't make good antibodies to type 2. And so you can still get type 2-mediated ADE as a consequence. So we need a better dengue vaccine. And they don't recommend it for people who have not been infected. Curiously, they only want you to take it if you've had at least one infection because it would act like that first dengue infection, at least for serotype 2, right? Sorry for the late reply. Middle of the night here. Oh, Rach, you're in uh, the Isle of Man, yeah, with the with the bagels. Is that right? We have a baker here called Noah's that makes plain bagels, nothing fancy. Yeah, Amy asked, oh, they have bagels in the Isle of of man, but you fell asleep and didn't hear it. Thank you. <laughs> That's funny. My spring allergies seem to be milder. Will this be permanent? Who knows? Hard to tell, Kensington Princess. Absolutely no. I mean, it could be coincidental that it happens to be this year. It may. I mean, did you wear a mask? Maybe that had something to do with it. Hard to know. Yes. So the, the news is Amy uh, probably has a job, but where it is, and she wants to get a letter first before she tells you where it is, okay? But I'm sure she'll tell you once she gets the letter. You'll be very excited to, to hear where she's going. Uh, in Delhi, India, we are seeing cases of people getting infected in a short span of 8 to 12 weeks. Is that normal? Well, what what do you mean by infected? Is this a PCR confirmed infection? It's eight to twelve weeks after what? Does vaccination the first dose, the second dose? So I need more information. 
before I tell you what I think, Priya. Thank you, Carmen, for your contribution. I got partner. I got COVID. She got symptoms Thursday. I tested negative. Rapid antigen Friday morning. I developed symptoms Sunday. Tested positive. I've been socializing maskless over Easter. She has no contacts. Am I the index case? No, you you have no idea. You got it from someone else, right? Not necessarily. The, the index case starts everything. So you're not for sure. If we know do, do two mRNA doses uh, eight weeks apart provide greater efficacy against severe disease than infection immunity. So it's hard to be definitive, right? Because I don't know what kind of immunity. So uh, infection immunity is somewhat heterogeneous because when you think about it, uh, you get infected with uh, different amounts of virus and you may have different extents of infection and, and hence different stimulation of your immune response. But you always get the same dose of vaccine, right? So it's a controlled dose. And we know, I mean, every person is different. So you respond differently to the vaccines, but we know what the, the range is. So two doses, eight weeks apart is really good at giving you a broad antibody response that would neutralize even Omicron. And, you know, because the vaccines are against the original virus. So all I can say is that's really good. But in, infection once? No, I don't think so. Infection immunity from one infection has been shown not to be as good as two vaccinations, especially spaced apart. After three vaccines, hay fever and asthma, much less correlation or causation. Well, it's it's correlation, right? You can only do causation, prove causation when you do some kind of observation or trial, right, with more people. So one person is not enough. All I can say is it's good, right? <laughs> you know, vaccines stimulate the immune system. And who knows what kind of interaction that might have with the parts that are causing hay fever and, and asthma. But you can't say anything from, from one person. That's the, that's the thing. That's what we emphasize in science all the time. If you want to make conclusions about causation, you have to do a proper observations that have enough people to convince you. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the CDC saying 60% of the U.S. has had COVID? So it, it, that what they're saying is that 60% is seropositive. That means they have antibodies to some viral protein. No, you're saying it's the N protein, okay? And it's an extrapolation always because you can't do serology on 60% of the U.S. It's too many people, too many assays, right? And you don't have to. You can do select samples all over the country. And, you you know, you have to plan it very carefully to make sure it's representative and then extrapolate. And that's the best we do because we're not going to do 60% of the people. So... Um, um, 60%, what do I think? It seems it seems reasonable. It's probably, um, you know, it may be an underreporting because a lot of people just simply don't respond even though they have been infected with the virus. But I think we'll see more of these surveys as time goes on. And as you know, because we're looking for antibodies to end, we know that's uh, from infection at least. You know, you, there are some vaccines that have uh, N in them, but Mostly we don't have them here in the U.S. So that's what I think. Uh, will the new podcast include fungal cases? Yeah, there were a couple tonight, actually. You're going to like it, Rob. Short, sweet, to the point, and there's bacteria, non-COVID viruses, fungi, and parasites. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Twin Daddy here had a two-part comment. FDA is exercising caution and waiting to approve mRNA vaccines for less than fives, even though there's good evidence on the safety, effectiveness, and benefit. 
While the safety of a fourth dose for adults is established, evidence on the effectiveness and benefit are sparse. I would prefer to see initial doses approved for younger kids. Yes, I would agree. I think they will be. I'm not privy to why it's taking longer. And I'm, I don't know if it's just that they're being extra cautious or there's some specific reason. I simply don't know. Yes, there are some bottom-feeding predatory journals that publish bad stuff, and in those you might find papers with an agenda of some sort. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> we certainly stay away from those. But they're there. There's not much you can do it. Let's see. Please comment on the Danish study on nonspecific beneficial effects on adenovirus vaccines reduced ACM while mRNA didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't look at it. But if you... I'll look it up. I'll look it up and let you know what I think. We are vaccinated and boosted twice. Should we travel? Yeah, you could travel. Sure. That's the whole point of being vaxxed and boosted twice, that you can travel. Absolutely. Go for it. I'm I'm not I'm sixty nine, but I'm vaxxed and boosted once. I'm starting to travel in May. And May, June, July, October, I'm going all over the place. Yep. Ooh, this is interesting. You missed Jonathan Reiner's gem of a comment today on CNN that the vice president catching means we need to quadruple down on masks and stop thinking vaccines make it better. It's an idiotic comment for sure. The reason she was asymptomatic was that she was vaccinated, right? And uh, no, we don't have to quadruple down on masks. <laughs> I mean, you can if you wish, but my position is this is as good as it's going to get. The virus isn't going away. They're going to have outbreaks every winter. And, you know, you're going to, it's going to be like influenza. If you want to wear a mask, that's great. But, you know, it's not like you can wear a mask for the rest of this season and then no more because it's going to be the same going forward. So it doesn't make sense to me. We'll be traveling where there's no Paxlovid, Molnupiravir, can get Luvox abroad. Thoughts on this as a backup plan? I'm not sure that my opinion matters. Um, fluvoxamine. I mean, it's better than nothing. It has had some efficacy, right? So, yeah, I mean, it would be nice. Let's see, third dose six months ago previous infection. It sounds to me like you're well protected. And so if you are, uh, if you get symptomatic and test positive and you can get Luvox, that seems to be a good option. But I'm not a doc, okay? Is it safe to get your booster over a year after your second dose? It is perfectly safe and not any less effective. Does it decrease the chances of side effects? Well, you know, the side effects, you know, with the uh, mRNA vaccines are in the second dose, right, in a certain age group. So you have to look at that. But I think if you, I don't know that overall it's going to decrease your, your side effect chances. They're already very low, right? Uh, for the mRNA vaccines, myocarditis is very low and only in specific ages uh, for the adenovirus vaccines. Again, very specific low of side effects. So uh, I don't think that's going to uh, impact that. Can you explain again why it's unlikely and borderline impossible that a virus can be made in a lab by modifying other viruses and making them more severe? Why is the media pushing it so much? <laughs> because it's sensational and that's what the media do, right? They want to, to sell you their product. And people like this idea that scientists can make viruses that kill the world. So I've, I've been modifying viruses for longer than most people, okay? I, I developed the technology or I demonstrated with one virus that it was possible to modify a virus. And 
we don't know how to make a virus more severe without debilitating it so that it wouldn't spread in people. I mean, I could put diphtheria toxin into a virus genome, right? That could make it more severe. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, I would never do that. And anyone caught doing that would get in big trouble. But then again, the people who would do that are not going to get caught. But that I guarantee that if you put diphtheria toxin into a virus, you're going to debilitate it so it won't spread. It won't even reproduce well. So we don't know many ways to make viruses more severe. I mean, the examples like that, putting a toxin in a virus is obvious. But as I said, it would, de it would debilitate it. And so um, <clears throat> I, I think it's, it's impossible to do because we don't understand fundamentally how to make viruses more severe and at the same time not making them unable to uh, transmit. So I think this is wishful thinking. People don't do that. Bona fide sciences don't do that. And the press just likes to bring up the idea because they don't really know. They have no experience in the field. They just think, oh, it should be possible to make something worse, right? Um, you can make other things worse. Why not viruses? But no, it doesn't work that way. And you have to have work with viruses to understand that. So I, I hope that makes it clear. You can't tinker with viruses most of the time without screwing them up. Viruses are precise products of evolution in nature where lots of mutant viruses are made and the best ones are selected for by whatever forces are out there. And we can't help to approximate that at all. We make a change and it mucks everything up. Did Dr. Griffin educate someone in D.C.? He's been talking about Paxlovid for so long, but it's just not available nationwide. But I saw the local news mention this new drug. I don't know. He certainly offered to help anyone. He gave his phone number out the last episode. If you can't get Paxlovid or monoclonal, call him. He's willing to stay up all night to help every American. <laughs> so... I'm sorry that it's not available in many places and many people don't even know about it. It's unfortunate. I guess we're spoiled here. We get all this great information. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. Why do lateral flow only use nasal now rather than throat and nose? It's good enough. Good enough to get the right specificity and accuracy. Don't 8% of asymptomatic cases have either a degree of organ damage if they get CAT scans or MRIs and as many as 25 to 30 get long COVID? I don't actually know the fraction of asymptomatic cases that progress to long COVID. And I would submit that nobody does because putting that data together is very, very difficult. Um, but you can probably see damage. Infl inflammation causes a lot of damage, and we've never really looked for it on this scale after virus infection. So it's not surprising that we see it. And whether it's related to long COVID, we don't know. A lot of questions uh, unclear. So if you're asymptomatic, yeah, you can get long COVID. But I don't know about the numbers. I don't know the mechanism. I don't know if the damage that you see is responsible for it. Why didn't Japan do a lockdown? Why does it seem they've done better with COVID? Is that true? They didn't do a lockdown? They've had issues with infections, right? So I'm not sure that they've done better than most of the developed world. I think they've had issues as well. And I'm not sure that they didn't do lockdowns from now. And I could be wrong, but I don't really know. My 80-year-old brother-in-law was prescribed Evusheld but has no comorbs. I realize he's older, but Evusheld is not without risk. Do you think this is a good idea just because of his age? <clears throat> I, I, I think the risk – here you have to do a, a balance of risks versus benefits, right? So I, I don't think there are substantial risks uh, associated. You're right. It's not zero. But um, 
yeah, over 80 years old, no comorbs, probably at least three times vaccinated. You, you test, here's the thing. If you're symptomatic and test positive, it's probably worth it just to make sure. Because if you wait to see if it gets worse, it's too late, right? But don't test. Because if you turn positive and you're not symptomatic, it's, it doesn't matter. And you wouldn't need every shell anyway. We're the OG science pods. No, not really. You know, there were other science podcasts before us. Um, but we jumped on pretty early. Um, uh, and we're fortunate to get in early and a lot of people jumped in after us but uh, there were certainly ones before us I don't claim to be uh, the original but I certainly did the first virology podcast right and we're, we're doing it every week multiple times a week I don't think anybody does that certainly not a working stiff scientist right So here we have a comment about Japan. Japanese culture is not Western. Masking in winter is considered good manners. We don't have in the West. Maybe masking was part of it. That's a good, that is a good, um, um, ex explanation for what might have happened. <laughs> yeah, so many, a lot of discussion about the Japan issue. There you go. So I don't need to highlight that. Is it safe to fly now because masks off? Well, you can wear a mask if you feel insecure. Many people do. Um, yeah, just wear a mask. Did Amy get her cash? What do you mean, cash? Oh, by the way, uh, your donations here uh, to her lab work amounted to almost $10,000. So thank you very much. Uh, she's going to... Use that wisely. <laughs> and wherever she goes, she can take it with her for sure. No, but, the, but the point is, she does have a job. She will be leaving. And that's kind of sad for me, but she needs to move on. Hopefully we can still do these together. We'll see. I assume that fully vaccinated, asymptomatic... PCR positive patients may have a low viral load, less likely to pass on. Is there evidence to support? So there's not a lot because, twin daddy, very few people measure infectious virus shedding. They all do PCR, and that is a poor um, uh, indicator of infectious virus. It's a poor surrogate for infectious virus. One study that's been done, just published out of Switzerland, showed that vaccinated people shed less infectious virus for a shorter period of time than unvaccinated people that should correlate with being less likely to pass it on but that study itself wasn't done you can't really do that so you have to you know infer it from the lower shedding for less time you could do a challenge study to do that but you know i'm, I'm not aware of it being done Uh, do you believe third shots, first boosters are unnecessary? So I think the, the there's some evidence that the one booster is good. It broadens. So because the first two doses were too close together to give you the proper maturation of the immune response, measured in antibodies now, the third dose is, is later and you're going to get good maturation. That's not We measure it in antibodies, but the assumption is it also applies to T-cells. So I think that third dose is good, although Amy would say for, for a lot of people it, it doesn't matter. But I don't, I don't agree with that. We disagree on that. Uh, so HPV provides sterilizing immunity. If that's true, and I'm not sure it is, Amy has disagreed with this. She's heard evidence that it's not actually sterilizing, but... How would, it provi how would it provide that? We don't know because you would have to maintain high levels of mucosal antibodies and we don't know how that happens at all. Okay, we have a tweet from Daniel and we have uh, infected 72% 0 to 11, 74, 12 to 17, 63, 49%, 33%, 
over 65% infected. I guess that's from that serology test. <laughs> I don't think it counts because it, I don't know. I am not an expert on kosher and trafe. Nope. That's very funny. Vincent, after CDC issued the report that's over 60% of adults and 75 percent kids, and that's what Vanity just put those numbers up, how should controlled groups in future studies be viewed as really immune? Well, that's a problem, right? It's going to be harder and harder to get a control group. They're going to have to be seronegative, and it's harder and harder to do that. Yep. Really um, hard to do. But you have to check people before they're enrolled in the study. I think that's the only thing. My mom says hi from Shanghai. She's been in lockdown and hasn't been out of her apartment for over a month, but she's hanging in there, sends her love and support. Good luck. Uh, get You'll get through it. <laughs> okay, now we're talking about sleep. Dr. Fauci said pandemic phase is over in the U.S. and explained people are not getting hospitalized, number of deaths not going up, it's not going away. Yeah, but... The pandemic is not a country-specific thing, right? That's the problem I have with it. The epidemic phase, I would say, is is contracting in the U.S. That's what I would say. But Fauci wants to use the P word, right? Because it gets people happy. It's fine. I don't think it's technically correct. I'd pay money to do a walking tour of New York with A and V. Uh, you could do it for free. If you want to do it, we'll do it. I don't understand why we don't have more and wider studies about TB cells after natural infection and vaccination. Yes, we have some, but you know we have some that say they last for for X months, but not longer. How long do they do last? Right, there are lots of memory cell studies now, but they're not long enough out to to know. But as you know, for SARS one, T cells lasted for seventeen years, so that's a good sign. That's a good sign. Uh, Wildlife Conservation Society, that's right. That's what Paul Kelly is the head of, and so technically the head of all the zoos, right? That's what they told us. Yes, alcohol may get, help you get to sleep, but it interferes with good sleep. So, yes, I'm doing an experiment where I'm not drinking any wine during the week now because I'm also sleeping crappy, <laughs> poorly. And I usually have a glass or two every night with dinner. And so it's been suggested that I try not drink. So no wine except on Friday and Saturday. So we'll see. Do it for a couple of weeks. We'll see if I sleep better. I didn't sleep well last night. Okay, and I, I didn't have any wine. <laughs> I woke up at 3 a.m. Sucks. I don't like it. I woke up at 3 a.m. and I think of all the crap I have to do. Well, it's not crap because I love doing it. But I worry a lot. Am I going to make this appointment? Am I going to make that appointment? And um, <clears throat> then it's hard to get back to sleep. But you don't want to know my sleep shit. It's okay. It's fine. Sorry about that. Uh, Penelope wants me to explain adenovirus. So an adenovirus is a virus, like SARS-CoV-2 is a virus, but it's got DNA in it instead of RNA. SARS-CoV-2 is RNA. Adenovirus has DNA. It's bigger. The DNA is bigger. And it's more stable because it's got a protein shell around it. As SARS-CoV-2 has a membrane. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of different adenoviruses that infect people and cause all kinds of diseases. They can cause eye infections, they can cause respiratory infections, they can cause gut infections and give you diarrhea and vomiting and so forth. And um, we only have one vaccine for recruits for respiratory adenovirus. For the most part, the infections are kind of mild. Now, we took adenovirus and we modified it to be a vaccine for COVID, and so we can use it as a vector. So that's the uh, quick course on adenoviruses. Uh, how contagious is Ebola? Not very. These chains of infection don't go very long. 145 close contacts. You mean they traced infection in 145 close contacts? Eventually they stop. 
eventually they stop um, transmitting. They do not go long, long chains, although in the uh, Western African outbreak, they did have very long chains because they were doing very bad things in hospitals and burials, which exposed people to very, very close contact. So that was a problem. Yes, it was lavender that was good at dealing with biofilms. That was the twim. So you get up one night at 3.15, then you wake up, and then you'll be tired, you will sleep. Yeah, then you sleep the next night, and then the next night you won't. I, I, I mean, I know that when I'm really tired, then I sleep well one night, and then it's back to the same crap. And why, why would Benadryl work? I'm not sure I want to take drugs. <laughs> if you were looking for viruses on Mars or one of the moons of Jupiter, what kinds of tests would need to be done? Well, the problem is you have to get samples back, right, to look for viruses, and so you have to go there. Can we go to moons of Jupiter? I suppose so. We can go to Mars, I suppose. So you have to bring back samples, and you can't. You have to make sure not to contaminate them. You have to make sure not to contaminate them. And that's hard. You, know, you bring them back to Earth, and what if you contaminate them with Earth viruses? But you bring back samples. So if there's vi to have a virus, you have to have something living. So you have to bring back something living, and then you look for a virus. You could just sequence its genome and look for viruses, although they may not rec be recognizable as a virus. You could grow the cells. So it's very hard. I mean, the way we look for viruses here is we sequence nowadays, right? So you could get samples, environmental samples from these planets and just bring them back and do genome sequencing. Um which you could actually initiate on the spaceship, on the rocket, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> People are, are sequencing in space. And so that could do it, yeah. When they cull birds, they make farmers wait five months to, just because there may be environmental contamination with uh, the virus, right? And uh, Or in other living things, uh, birds and so forth. So they want to wait to make sure that's gone and so that the, the replenished stocks are not re infected uh, as well. <laughs> now we're talking about birds. Try to understand some of these questions. Benadryl, Rex, sleep architecture. All right, I'm not going to take Benadryl. Don't worry. I fall asleep right away. The problem is I wake up. <clears throat> Are things getting better? I feel impending doom. No, I've, no, it's getting much better, Patricia. Go on your trip. Go somewhere good and enjoy it. Every year I get a flu shot, and then I hear they got it wrong. What are people talking about? Does it still protect me? So they don't get it wrong every year, Stephen. <laughs> some years they get it right. Some years they don't. But it still protects you against really severe disease and dying. All right? So even if there's a mismatch, you, you can get sick. You might get nasty flu, but you'll not go in a hospital, and you won't die. So it's working. So please do it. Get your flu vaccine every year. Many species of birds get High path avian influenza. Flamingos, owls, pigeons, swans, gulls, storks, eagles. No songbirds, though. That's the key. Twivotees. That's another good one. So we had veeps and twivotees. You could put that on a t shirt. Let me write it down. You know, in Madison, and I'm going to throw t shirts out into the audience. I was thinking of throwing out the countering a miasma of anti-think t-shirt remember twiv ot's oh, that's good thank you principal manager <laughs> this is pretty funny i got a bad disease i feel that amy has info that i need vincent it seems tells me epitopes will save me that's great very good john <laughs> really good you guys are clever on point tonight Did you hear about the vaccine for herpes in elephants? Yeah, I did. 
And this is really bad because ele the elephants will die. And, you know, zoo elephants are precious and they get this herpes virus from other elephants and they die. It's very bad. And yes, it, the vaccine I have, have heard, I hope it works. It would be great. Do you think China knows more about SARS-CoV-2 than they are sharing? Uh, I think they do, but I don't think it has anything to do with zero COVID. No, I think that they have some information that they're not sharing, and I don't know what, what it particularly is, but um, it's unfortunate. But I don't think it has anything to do with zero COVID. I think they think the NH5N1 will be next. No. Well, they did for a while. There was a period where the U.S. went through worrying, the world went through worrying about H5N1. So the U.S., you know, has a stockpile of H5N1 vaccine. It's a part of the national stockpile. So they're concerned about it going pandemic, but I don't think it's going to. It's never been able to transmit effectively among people. It's had over 50 years to try. I don't think so. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Could, should vaccinated Americans go to countries with low vaccination rate, even if the pandemic is over in the U.S.? I would because I feel a vaccination protects me. Not 100%, but I'm willing. If you, if you want to go somewhere badly enough, you, you have to be willing to take the risk. You could wear a mask. If you're worried, but you know, there could be a 10, 20% chance of you getting pretty sick. It depends how badly you want to go there. If you have to go for work, you, you know, think carefully about it. Okay. Let's start to wrap up. Oh, do people with SARS-CoV-2 spread it too, or just people with disease? Yes. You don't have to have symptoms to spread Absolutely not. That's why this virus spreads so effectively because asymptomatic people, people with asymptomatic infection spread very efficiently. So they're out and about. They don't know they're sick. They're not staying home and they spread it really well. So that's the difference between this and SARS-1 where there was very little asymptomatic spread of infection. Uh, would even with syncytia, the viral proteins be presented at the cell surface and thus picked up? Well, I mean, so yes, they would be to a certain extent, right? So those cells could be targeted. I mean, the proteins are going to be presented by MHC anyway, whether or not there's syncytia or cell-to-cell -cell spread. So I, I don't think that gets around immune recognition at all, no. Uh, so we had over 500 people, 300 likes. Let's get it to 400, folks, before I leave here tonight. Could a universal vaccine be made with H1, 2, and 3? I, I think so. There are some conserved epitopes. Um, but um, it's in development. I think it can be done, yeah. Okay. Let's move down through here and see who else we have to thank before we leave. Thank you, John, for your contribution. It's not much, but it's honest cash. <laughs> you can give a dollar. You can give as much as or little as you want. We all, I appreciate any contribution. I appreciate your participation here uh, tonight. I, I, I really enjoy... Uh, speaking with all of you and uh, being your professor for an evening a week. <laughs> thank you so much, Marge. Thank you for your contribution as well. I like it when I go into detail. That's my shtick, Tom. You know that from taking my lecture. I like detail, and I like to do it in a way you can understand. How good would smallpox vaccine from the 60s last? Um. 60s is, is pushing it, depending on how it's stored. So that, that would have to be re, re, uh, redone. How long after 
va- infection should someone get vaccinated? Yeah, eight weeks would be good. You could go longer. The longer, the better. Then you balance with, you know, getting reinfected. Thank you, Morris, for your contribution. Appreciate it. Would you be interested in talking to a neuroscientist who is now more of a computational researcher who designs black box systems for drug testing? It depends. I'd have to see some of the work. Send me some. Vincent at microbe.tv. <laughs> yeah, Amy's still doing this show. Yeah, she just leaves after an hour, but hopefully she can continue. I mean, it's the thing that where she's going, may not let her do it. We'll see. Thank you, Jane from the country. Ah, same Jane from the country for your contribution. Thank you, Allie. Your contribution to science education uh, at the incubator. <laughs> and thank you, Sylvia. Matt Walker, better how to promote better sleep. Yes, yeah, sleep is a big issue. Oh, this is cool. I am too devoted to you. Thank you, Emily. Very kind of you. <laughs> you guys are great. This is awesome. Thank you, Ian, for your contribution. I have vaccinated and overkill, both of which are good reads. Yeah, those are good reads. You'll enjoy. And thank you, Michael, from Mexico City. I've been there multiple times. All right, folks. Moderators tonight, thank you. Steph, Les, Vanity Nutrition, Tom, and Frank. And, uh, folks, I know sometimes you get timed out and you're not happy. Sorry. It's just they're doing their job. They're doing their best trying to make it a civilized place for us to have our little conversation. Well, we didn't get over 400. It's just it's just like 36 more to get over 400, 36 likes. Please do it before you leave tonight. I heard early on that blood type had influence. No, the blood type thing turned out not to be true for a variety of reasons, but not true. Okay, folks, thanks for another great evening of virology where else can you get an evening of virology every week in a reasonably good uh, environment press the like mu- button folks please before you go come on do it it's real easy it's right in front of you thanks for coming and do come back next week 8 p.m eastern time wednesday night i appreciate your presence and uh, don't forget be safe everybody good night